Hello, Charlie, you there? Charlie, are you there? Yeah. All right. We had some trouble logging in tonight. I've been here since about 5.55. I had some trouble with the computer. It didn't recognize. So I had to go through a login procedure. But our speaker's here, and we're going to get started about 5.15 or so. So uh, we'll be ready real soon, okay? Okay, sounds good. we we'll do a sound check, and we'll be ready. We got a few people here at the restaurant, so we're going to be ready soon. Sorry I logged in a little later than I'd like. But I was here at 4.30, got everything set up. All right, we'll be, I'll be, let let people in real quick. All right, I'll be back, Charlie. Not going All right. anywhere. All right, Andy. Yeah, more people than I'm so real quick if I take on all they do is just walk in when they come I'll pick that up and I'll it. Yeah, whenever I'll probably have to get that going. I mean, I just need it. Yeah. We'll go. How long is what time I speak? I don't know about how it's All right, and then check the sound out to see if you can hear it. See if we can hear it. Hello. Charlie, testing. can you hear it? Testing, testing. Yeah. What? I, I don't know about air dig. You're you're so loud. You be quiet. Hello. All right. Thank you. You gotta speak louder, Andy. 
speak louder. I'm speaking right into this microphone. In a good all way. right. Yeah, that's, that's all right. right. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to download this. I'm going to wrap it around that snake. Okay. Right, there's your removable disc. Well, which one's your presentation? That's the disc. Oh, okay. Um, Eleven four twenty three seal PPTX. Yes. Right here. <laughs> I'm going to download it to my local drive. Who is that damn thing right now? Where's the damn file at? All right, you still there, Charlie? Yes. Okay. He's getting his PowerPoint set up and we should be good to go in a couple of minutes here. God damn it. Hey, right, Mike. Hey, hi, Charlie. How are you? All right. Oh, that thing I don't see Tim. Is he there? Yeah, I'm here. You see the College of Complexes group there? Oh. Is this it? Yeah, hopefully this is it. God damn it, now we're having trouble with the PowerPoint now. Tim and Charlie, maybe you can answer my question concerning Zoom. Um, I'm ha I have trouble getting into uh, the college because of Zoom. Does Zoom have to be updated? Might have to be. 
So in other words, Zoom is not just playing Zoom. Uh, <coughs> regularly or from time to time, you have to uh, update it? No. Yes. You yeah, would we'll do it automatically. Hmm. Come on. They all do that automatically when you log in. Trouble here. Haven't you, haven't you seen, haven't you gotten updates before on things? It does it automatically. Microsoft updates their stuff all the time. Yeah. Trying to get its PowerPoint up now and I can't seem to find it. When you log in, it says, wait a few minutes, we're updating our, uh, our controlling our software. Doesn't ask you to. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm coming, Charlie. I'm just having trouble. Yeah, obviously. It's fucking internet connections on stick. God damn it. This is crazy. <laughs> 11423. God damn it. Having trouble getting this PowerPoint up. Um, because it's this, this is let's go back to your desk. Well, I sent it by email. Try using that one. All right, yeah, send it to send it by email. He already did. I sent it Franklin distribution. You already have it. All right, all right, Charlie, hang on. I'll open my email. You should open your email before every meeting, like I do. Well, we're we're doing we're doing it now, Charlie. God, I've never had this much trouble. Take your here's your disc. Sorry about that. We're gonna. Oh, we'll have it ready in a minute. God damn it. God damn it. Oh, come on. We'll be ready soon enough, Charlie. God damn it. I didn't expect all these technical problems today. He's yeah, he's here and he's in person. Speakers in person.
We'll be ready in a minute. Okay, everybody's still all right. Got his PowerPoint up. We got it up. Um, yeah, we're going to have an announcement period first. All right, Andy, is that mic ready to go? Want to get that mic set up there? See if we can do it again or do we need another battery on it? Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Can you, can you hear okay? Can you hear it, Charlie? Yeah. Can All right. Put it on. Put it on the stick. Okay. Can you hear put, okay. Put it up on the. Let's uh, go up on this thing. Yeah. Hi. Looks good. Okay, we're ready to go. I think. All right, Andy, I'm going right. to have you introduce this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this not is, yet. Not yet. Charlie's going to introduce it. Then. No, I'm going to let you introduce oh, it, and Charlie's going to do announcements. All right. Oh, he's he's got to welcome everyone to the college. I know he does. I got to start the recording now. As soon as I put my finger down, we're going to go. All right. Now we are. Okay. Welcome to the College of Complexes. This is November 4th, 2023. We have three rules at the college. One pool at a time, no personal attacks, and be kind to the waitress. So uh, Charlie will give you a rundown of the upcoming events. All right, Thank Charlie, you. go ahead. All right, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,741 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, as always, I will recommend we have a Google and a Meetup email groups. Uh, you should subscribe to either one of those or both. Uh, not much traffic. In instructions on the center uh, top of our main website. And although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our eight upcoming programs. On November the 11th, our own veteran of the college, Karina Kushim, we give a program in which she says, stop working hard. American corporate culture does not reward hard work. I knew that a long time ago. On November the 18th, we're going to have a gentleman who Spent some time in Eastern Europe, uh, specifically Lithuania, in the Baltic countries adjacent to the Soviet Union. Uh, but it's, he's going to say, lessons I learned in Lithuania. Should be an interesting thing and give us an update on the Ukraine situation. On November the 25th, uh, our own Tim Bolger uh, will be talking about his Biden, the puppet of Obama and how powerful forces have a secret path or plan for Obama to serve a third term as president of the United States. On this December the 2nd, first of our upcoming candidates for the March uh, election, Sharon Waller 
a candidate for the commissioner of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, will be telling us uh, why we should vote for her. On December the 9th, um, in the Anderson, whom you just saw, we'll be talking about what people can do for constructive change concerning the climate crisis and updated news on other criminal problems. I imagine his conspiracy theories. On December the 16th, my own presentation will be given on how I can solve the climate crisis through a simple three-step process to terraform the Earth into a habitable planet. Don't miss this one. We'll be taking a holiday break on December 23rd and 30th. Uh, and uh, the next, oh, wait a minute. Okay, um, and the next program after that is December uh, the 13th. Uh, Dr. Mike Rouse, who is a expert on Middle East affairs, will be talking about Holocaust and genocide, specifically the situation in Palestine and, and Israel. On January 6th and the 27th, they're presently open. On January the 20th, Kathy Powers, the activist, well-known activist in Chicago, will be talking about disability accessibility <clears throat> in the city with a focus on public transit. Okay, Tim, that's it. Thank you. Take it away. Okay. Uh, go up there and let's introduce our speaker tonight. Introduce yourself and let's get, over, get right into your presentation. All right. You can hear me okay. A little louder if you don't mind. A little louder. I thought I get a little closer. Yeah. Um, all right. My name is Scott Allen. I am the Renewable Energy Policy Coordinator for the Citizen Utility Board. And so I'm going to talk about climate and energy legislation uh, upcoming. Um, First, though, I'm going to give the preamble about CUB, what we are, a not-for-profit uh, utility watchdog and consumer advocate in the state. Um, we were established in 1983 with the Citizens Utility Board Act, a uh, project of Pat Quinn. Most of our work is doing community outreach, speaking engagements like these. Uh, we also talk one-on-one -on -one with consumers, help them try to save money. We advocate for programs that save people money at the legislature. Um, we fight rate cases at the Commerce Commission, try to keep rates low. Uh, but we also, uh, one of our priorities is, is laid out in the CUB Act is to protect the health and well being of the people of Illinois. Um, so, if you go to the next slide, I want to get into a little bit of the timeline about how we got here. Mm -hmm energy policy, and it kind of gives us an idea of, of where we're going in the future. So, um, <laughs> excuse me, we can see that we start with the 1997 Electric Service Customer Choice and Rate Relief Act. Around that time, utility prices were getting out of control. The state, the legislature said, well, we need to do something about that. What do we do? Uh, that's when ComEd, Ameren, uh, what eventually became Ameren, they had to sell off all of their electricity generating assets. So the coal plants, get rid of that. And now these utilities make all of their money on the distribution of electricity. And this also gives people who are uh, customers of ComEd or Ameren, you can go out and buy your electricity from any one of the hundred or so electricity suppliers out there. It also uh, throws supply rates for 10 years. And then eventually, um, the idea was after that uh, freeze ended, then people go out and they start shopping around for these, uh, these supply contracts in, as individuals. So we had to have a way for if, if people are going to go out and buy electricity from somebody else and then ComEd's going to deliver it to them, uh, how do you find who, who takes care of the people who don't want to go out and make that choice? Um, so that gets us into the 2007 Illinois Power Agency Act. We created the power agency to procure electricity for customers who don't make a choice. So 
I can go out and make a contract with somebody to buy kilowatt hours at a certain price. Uh, if I don't want to do that, um, I don't have to. The power agency goes to the market. They buy that energy for ComEd customers who don't make a choice. ComEd passes that electricity to them, uh, taking no profit. Um, we also established, this is kind of where things take off in Illinois. We told the Illinois Power Agency to put together a, 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 an energy efficiency portfolio standard for Illinois as a way to using energy efficiency measures to reduce the demand that we need for electricity. It also created the net metering program. So for people who generate their own electricity through solar, they now have a way in, in the law that says you have to be compensated X amount for that electricity that you generate but don't use and send back to the utilities grid. And then up to 2011 with the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act, this is where the state said, so uh, we're gonna start to see a lot of renewable energy come online and our grid is not prepared for it. Our grid is still, hasn't really changed much since the early 1900s. So we as a state, we need to tell the investor-owned utilities that they need to prepare their grids. They need to start installing smart meters so that people can be credited properly. And then we can offer these new pricing programs to consumers. Um, so that's where a lot of that money was spent. And now we start to see a shift in the state planning from going toward this centralized generation where you have a coal plant and then 50 more miles where you have another coal plant. We're gonna distribute generation, uh, solar fields. Some people have distributed generation on their roofs. Um, so that was a huge investment in Illinois energy grids. It also in, introduced the, what we call formula rate making. So these utilities go out, they spend their money on their infrastructure and they get kind of rubber stamped. So the Commerce Commission is going to trust that the work that you did was necessary and useful. And here is your, you know, here's all the money from ratepayers to make up for that cost. Out of this program, we did get those smart meters. We started to get pricing programs for ComEd customers. It's called hourly pricing. And we got demand response programs. Um, uh, an example of that would be like AC cycling. Uh, then uh, 2016, we see the Future Energy Jobs Act. And so we have a renewable portfolio standard in the state. And the Future Energy Jobs Act really was, the idea of that was to figure out how to make the renewable portfolio standard actually work. It created mechanisms. And so this is where we decided that we want to generate 30% of the electricity in Illinois from renewables by the year 2030. But we have to find a way to incentivize people to come in and actually build those projects because the state of Illinois is not going to be in the business of, of, of hiring forces to go out and build solar projects. So the scheme that they create, well, I say scheme, but I, I mean that in kind of a general term uh, or in a general way. We created the renewable energy credit system. Um, we have this program through which all of these renewable energy credits flow. And we have programs like community solar that allow for solar subscriptions and solar for all, which is a program that's aimed at low income uh, residents of Illinois. And we also increased our energy efficiency uh, standards in 2016. Um, this meant that ComEd and Ameren would have to reduce the amount of electricity that they sold or that they delivered to their customers. And so this is how we get investor-owned utilities, the regulated utilities, this is how we get them to do their part for um, kind of fighting climate change and reducing the amount of energy that people need. We say that if you want to earn money, you have to figure out ways for your consumers to use less electricity. So we start to see rebates uh, on energy efficient equipment, or we start to see rates that say, if you use less electricity during times of peak demand, we'll give you a credit on your bill. Um, the problem with this was 2016 that uh, we didn't really, we had these systems in place, these renewable energy credits, we just didn't know how to really operationalize them. 
So that got us the 2021 Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. Uh, it was a little more focused or it was a little more focused on racial equity and on low income consumers and bringing everybody into the renewable energy economy. It also accelerated our, our, uh, our climate targets, our renewable energy targets. So as it stands right now in law, Illinois has to get 40% of its electricity from renewable energy by 2030. By 20 or 2040, we have to get 50% of our electricity from renewable energy and then 100% carbon free by 2050. It also provided more money to the existing program, Solar for All, for example, that low income solar program went from having a $10 million per year budget to now having a $50 million per year budget. And it was also a massive jobs program. So we'll have these job hubs uh, all across the state. I think there are three here in Chicago that are designed to bring the most vulnerable people in, train them to uh, work in the, the renewable energy industry and the buildings industry, the energy efficiency industry, and send them out to build this massive amount of infrastructure that we need. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, this is the timeline that the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act laid out. Uh, we have a we have deadlines on fossil fuel generation, and you can see that uh, by um, twenty thirty we're going to close out coal in the state. And so you might hear I hear a lot uh, down <laughs> down in in my part of the state that this is the bill that came along and forced the early closure. It's it's causing all these these coal plants to close down, and that was a huge mistake. All of the uh, Bistra coal fleet in downstate Illinois, and I believe the NRG coal fleet up here in Chicago, they had announced their closures at least a year before CJA was even negotiated and, and signed. So the idea that this law came along and forced these coal plants to close is not the case. Um, these announcements came in 2019 and the bill didn't pass until 2021. But um, that's the idea. So close the coal plants and the dirtiest gas plants in 2030. And then if you see all the way at the end of the timeline, uh, but, you know, by the time we get to, to 2050, we have no more coal and gas. There's an exception here though, the publicly owned coal plants and publicly owned gas plants get an exemption. They don't have to close until 2045. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the city of Springfield, which owns a coal plant that it, uh, built in, I think it opened in 2008, uh, their newest one. And then the Prairie State Coal Plant down in Southern Illinois opened in 2006. And it is by far the dirtiest coal plant in the state, uh, one of the dirtiest in the nation. And it is allowed by law to run until 2045. That is Prairie State, yes. Um, it's a pretty interesting story why they got these exemptions, but that is sort of the problem that we have. Most of long-term coal contracts in this country, 90 plus percent of them are locked up or taken up by publicly owned utilities. So municipal utilities and cooperative utilities. Um, so that's sort of a, a look at, I, the kind of the evolution of our energy legislation and um, uh, the, the track that Illinois is, is on. Uh, some things have happened since CJ passed that I want to address before I talk about the upcoming uh, legislative sessions. And uh, it'll kind of help explain why we're doing in this state what we're doing for the next several years. So uh, first we saw the Texas grid disaster uh, not not quite yet. The Texas grid disaster in uh, 2022, I'm sure people heard about that, where the grid nearly collapsed and people were getting billed all of this money. Um, that caused gas prices to, home heating gas prices to increase quite a bit. Uh, they never recovered for that. And then uh, on the heels of that came Russia's war in Ukraine, which further constrained global gas prices. And though 
Uh, methane gas prices have come down a little bit. They're still at least twice as high now as they were, say, five years ago. Um, and this has kind of destroyed the notion of cheap gas. This idea that uh, we can run our entire country on natural gas forever because it will always be cheap. Um, it also showed, showed us, Texas showed us that coal and gas, this idea that coal and gas are the only reliable baseload generators. Uh, they, you can run them 24 hours a day and you can keep them steady or you can ramp them up and ramp them down. Uh, the failure in Texas was with gas and coal. It, it got so cold that the gas wells froze up and coal piles froze up. So those assets didn't perform. And then the same thing happened last Christmas, uh, around Christmas of 2022 in the Northeast. They had a near grid collapse out on that grid. And it was, again, mostly coal and gas that couldn't perform. So um, now next slide, so let's talk about the grid. Just a quick explanation of what I mean by the grid. So um, we have kind of three grids in the country. We have the Western Interconnect, the Eastern Interconnect, and then Texas. And that explains, I mean, this, this is why what happened in Texas happened because Texas is cut off from both the Western and the Eastern Interconnect. So when things happen like that, there is no way to move electricity from other states, other power markets into Texas. Um, and so we have these two kind of big grids and they are managed by uh, private entities that have governmental powers. If you go to the next slide, I will show that. So they're what we call, um, you know, in some cases, independent system operators or uh, regional transmission organizations. And um, in Illinois, you can see from the map here that most of the state of Illinois is covered by uh, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator or MISO, and then up here in Chicago, and then over toward the east, it is a PJM grid. So the responsibility of these organizations is one to make sure that there is adequate electricity where it's needed in its footprint. Um, so if you look at MISO, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big space. We're in zone four here in Illinois. So if we start to have power outages here, the idea is that MISO is going to try to move power from elsewhere on its grid into Illinois to try to help relieve that. So um, they maintain they don't maintain, they uh, kind of plan the building of transmission lines so that we can move, um, we can move electricity interstate. And like I said, these are, they have kind of governmental powers. They're overseen by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. But these organizations are made up of utilities. So who, who controls these decisions, who makes these decisions. In PJM's case, and for our purposes here, it's ComEd. They have people on that. And so, you know, it, it's not independent regulators who are making these decisions about how do we plan our grids, it's utility companies. Um, so this kind of gets into another problem that came up since the passage of, of CJA and as a result of the Texas disaster and then the war in Ukraine down in MISO um, in Ameren territory. Um, we saw a, uh, a huge problem with what was what's called the capacity market. And what happened in that case is that um, so I guess a little explanation, there's a difference between energy and capacity. So energy is what is making the lights go here. It's what is going out to the customers. Whereas capacity is the padding, the, the promise to be able to make electricity when it's most needed. And the way that works is that these regional transmission operators, they go to every power plant in their footprint and say, how much capacity can you promise if called upon? And a coal plant, an independent coal plant will say, we can promise 500 megawatts of electricity at any time, uh, the hottest part of the day, we can promise that much. Well, um, uh, in Ameren territory, the summer before last, 
there weren't nearly enough power plants who were saying we would be willing to pledge those. Part of that is because coal plants were closing, again, not because of any regulation, but because owners of coal plants stopped making money on coal a long time ago. So they that's why they're closing these plants. They don't make money on them anymore. So we have fewer generators out there who say we have the you know, we can pledge this much electricity. So we saw prices in Ameren territory go from $5 per megawatt day to uh, I think $255 per megawatt day. And that caused our individual rates to go up quite a lot. Um, and then MISO came to town, they came to Springfield and they started talking about having blackouts, rolling blackouts. And they were really putting the fear of God into people and uh, they were saying that Illinois is insane to be closing all of these coal plants. This problem is, is, is never gonna end and you guys are gonna be choked by these high prices forever. Uh, it did raise awareness um, among the population that we have serious problems with our transmission system. Uh, these regional transmission operators, again, were, which are comprised of that we need to build transmission for about a decade. And so we have not spent the money on our grid that we should have been spent, uh, we should have been spending. And the reason that this transmission is so important, like I said, because that allows us to push large amounts of electricity around uh, the state and in between states. And since renewable energy is distributed and we have a field here and a field there and wind farms here and wind farms there and um, yes the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing but it is somewhere and we need these transmission lines to be able to take uh, electricity where it is where the wind is blowing the sun is shining we need to be able to move it around these territories well we haven't kept up on transmission building so we have in illinois we have tens of thousands of megawatts of solar that are either built and not energized or projects in the pipeline that we cannot interconnect to the grid because our transmission capacity is so far behind. Um, and plus, you know, the kind of the last thing, I guess, uh, that has, well, a second to last thing that has happened since Seizure passed is that, you know, we're finding out every year that the climate disaster is, things are much worse than we thought they were. <laughs> so um, every year it's like, well, we're not moving fast enough. We're not moving fast enough. Um, and so we're not doing enough as it is right now. And I think it's pretty commonly accepted in most places that we can definitely do without coal generation by the year 2030. And so you see, I mean, like I said, here in Illinois, we've carved out an exemption for one of the dirtiest plants in the country saying that we'll let you operate at least 15 years beyond what we know to be kind of the drop dead date for coal generation. Um, because we've carved out these publicly owned utilities not only have we let them keep their bearded generation, we've also told them that you don't have to do anything to reduce uh, your emissions. You don't have to do anything to prepare your grid. We know that it's politically unpopular to tell a municipal utility what to do. So we're just not gonna tell you to do anything because uh, we don't want that fight. And that is what, um, that is kind of what we're lacking. One of the things we're lacking in the state. Um, so there was kind of a fear after Siege of Pass, that we we're going to see a massive influx of uh, gas, gas power generation in the state. And so right now, I think we've only seen two kind of major, huge, large capacity gas plants being planned. And um, I don't know if the one up here has broken ground, but the one kind of down near where I live has not broken ground yet. So not sure what's going on there, but that rush into the state of all these gas speculators hasn't come yet. Uh, and then finally, the last kind of thing that happened since CJA passed is the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. Uh, there's some good and some bad from that act as, as kind of as I see it. 
it's trying to solve climate change through the tax code. So rather than just telling people that you have to shut down these huge sources of pollution, they're trying to incentivize people to generate electricity from clean resources. Is that the most effective way to fight climate change? I guess it depends on how seriously you think the climate disaster is. Um, it's not the route that I would have picked, um, but it is incentivizing and helping consumers, getting them some money to help make the transition away from uh, gas in the home and it's giving money to developers uh, to develop these solar uh, like solar and wind projects. Uh, on the bad side of the Inflation Reduction Act is the gigantic amount of money that they make available for carbon capture utilization and sequestration. And so this has come out, this has been a lifeline to the coal and gas plants that would otherwise shut down. The government is paying, I think, $85 per ton of carbon dioxide that's captured and sequestered. Um, so two years ago, people talking about carbon capture and sequestration, it was just not economic. Nobody wanted to invest in it. But now that you can claim all of these tax credits, in Illinois, we see just a, this massive influx of um, um, private corporations, we've got a venture capital saying, what can we attach this technology to and collect all of this tax, these tax credits? So that's what's happened. That's kind of the context since 20, the uh, end of 2021. And um, uh, we're talking now about the upcoming uh, legislative sessions. And I think that is the next slide, just to kind of give an idea of, of what the, what's going to be contained in those sessions, at least as far as I know. Um, first is clean buildings. So CJA was kind of seen as this is how we clean up the electricity generation side. And that's, you know, that, that's pretty big, right? But it doesn't do any, it didn't do much for the buildings and transportation sectors. So in Illinois, we are in pretty good shape as far as energy generation goes, despite the fact that we're leaving the filthiest coal plant open. Um, but now transportation emissions and you know buildings emissions are overtaking the energy generation sector. Uh, there's also this kind of wisdom in the state that you can only pass an energy bill, a big energy bill in Illinois once every five years. And so CJO was 2021. So um, I think from here on out, we're gonna see smaller sector-wide bills uh, come about. And like you said, the first one that um, at least the CUB, uh, this is a priority for CUB. It's also CUB's a member of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. That was sort of, the, they were the authors of CJA. This is where a lot of attention is focusing on, on clean buildings. Um, so a, a couple of things to keep in mind is that um, we're also finding out a little more every year the really bad health impacts of combustion indoors. So our water heaters, furnaces, stoves, especially the smaller area you're in and the most marginalized people tend to live in the oldest, smallest kind of buildings with improper ventilation. And this has really, really bad health impacts. So um, the, other, the other thing is that the price of gas has gotten so high, and I'm sure uh, anybody who pays the, the gas to peoples probably understands that, where these gas companies are going out and spending massive amounts of money on infrastructure, they want to replace their pipes. And our thinking on that is, we all kind of know that gas is going away. So why are you spending billions of dollars to replace your pipes when you're going to be out of business in another 20 years anyway? Um, so all of these things have kind of converged to say that the best thing to do is probably to just find a better source of uh, home heating, home, you know, home heating, home cooking, home water heating. And, and so that's what this bill is designed to do. But it also has, we have to keep in mind that 
the people who are most affected by this are the ones who can least afford to transition away from it. So this bill has to be pretty carefully crafted to make sure that we don't leave those people behind, one, and two, they don't get caught up in what we call the utility debt spiral, whereas wealthier people can um, install geothermal and install heat pumps and solar panels and all of this other stuff. And meanwhile, uh, the poorer people, as People's Gas, for example, sheds customers and their customer base shrinks more and more, they're going to have to increase rates to cover their costs. And that's left on the people who can least afford to pay. So that's what this legislation aims to do is find a, an off ramp for gas, but not leave the most vulnerable people on the hook for paying for it. Um, I think that spring of 2023, we expect to see legislation filed um, in the General Assembly, and it's going to be a fight, uh, obviously, the gas companies and probably the, um, you know, any, any, ancillary, any ancillary businesses or trades that, uh, that have an interest in building that gas infrastructure are going to fight it. So, you know, we'll test that theory about being able to pass large climate and energy bills more than or one one sooner than every five years. Uh, the second piece of legislation I expect that will be introduced uh, next spring is to deal with that amaran capacity problem I described. Um, MISO, the, the grid operator, uh, they are finally starting to better plan and uh, start these transmission projects. And we're going to see some of those beginning. So those are you know, more for the, the region. Ameren as a utility to build transmission projects within its own boundaries. Um, in about a month, they're gonna go before the Commerce Commission and get approval to start building these transmission projects. But we still need to ensure that A, we are running this grid in a way that uh, has more of an emphasis on using energy efficiency as a way to reduce peak demand. So the less electricity we use, the less transmission we need to build. Um, so I, I, I do expect that that is going to be a major piece of legislation that we see next year, and it, it will also be a pretty significant fight. And I think it's important, again, to say here that included in any of this kind of capacity reform, the publicly owned utilities are not going to be required to do anything. So you have a co-op downstate that they suffer the same problems that <laughs> the rest of the state does where they need transmission, but nobody is telling them that you have to invest in your transmission grid. So uh, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. And it gets into the third, and this is Hope. This is more of my kind of pet project is a lot of my work now focuses on publicly owned utilities. Um, and this was this is a tough one for me because I I don't necessarily like that uh, essential services like electricity are commodities and sold for profit to people. Um, so I do like the idea of the public owning the source of generation, but I have also seen kind of the, um, just the utter negligence that some of these publicly owned utilities treat their, their owners, their consumers, owners, rate payers, taxpayers with, and just the neglect that they have, uh, uh, have, have shown toward their utility. Um, one of the problems is that you take a, a publicly owned utility, for example, that Prairie State coal plant is owned by most of the publicly owned utilities in the state. So you have the, a lot of, uh, Naperville is the largest municipal utility in the state. Takes a, they get a large amount of their electricity from that coal plant. Yet the people of Naperville are not allowed to see how that plant performs. They're not allowed to look at the operations and maintenance costs. Um, 
they're not allowed to uh, lobby at the board who manages all of that for them. They're just totally shut out of that process. And that's not right. I mean, that is public money that keeps all of this stuff going and they're not allowed to have any input whatsoever. So we're hoping to introduce a bill this spring that will put transparency requirements on those publicly owned utilities and say that if you use public money to operate coal plants, gas plants, you have to allow public planning in that process. You have to have some kind of oversight. Um, people who, uh, people who are customers of, I call them owners, members of the publicly owned utilities, of the municipal and co-op utilities, they also aren't offered any consumer protections. So, for example, the, you know, we, we tell ComEd through law, and then it's enforced by the Commerce Commission that you can't shut your customers off under these circumstances. There are no protections like that for municipal and municipally owned utilities. That doesn't mean that every municipal utility shuts customers off on a regular basis. The point is that there are no protections guaranteed to them. Um, these utilities don't offer programs for low-income people. So the, the, the whole the whole purpose behind CJ is that we were going to give an opportunity for everybody in the state to participate in kind of the clean energy economy, whether or not they could afford it. And so we have these programs like community solar and light solar for all that say, if you can't afford solar, we can still get you bill credits by subscribing to a solar farm. People in, uh, who belong to publicly owned utilities don't have that same access. So if you live in Naperville and you can afford solar, great. Uh, if you can't, I, too bad you, you know, you're too poor to uh, participate in this. And we believe that those people need rights as well. Um, so like I said, this is the one that I'm most excited about and we hope that it gets introdu uh, introduced next spring as well. Um, and I think that uh, if we go to the next slide, talk about the veto session, which um, we're in the middle of it right now. The first week of veto session wrapped up, uh, I believe last week, and then the next part, the second half of veto session, I believe is next week. So we're kind of in the middle of, in the middle of veto session. And over the summer, the veto session looked to be like maybe it was going to be a little bit wild. But I think that things have kind of calmed down. Um, I highlighted two kind of major pieces of, of uh, business that could potentially affect the, kind of the climate and energy world. Um, for carbon capture, usage and sequestration, this was a huge one. Um, and I just, I'll just give a little bit of background on that because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, so it kind of starts off with this company called Navigator wanted to run a carbon dioxide pipeline from the Dakotas down through Iowa into Illinois. And this kicked off this idea around the country that Illinois was going to be kind of the garbage dump for CO2 because we have the perfect geology. And so you have all of these companies that are saying that we're going to, we're going to pipe in carbon dioxide from every part of the country and it's all going to go into central Illinois. Um, so that's kind of, that's where all of this kicked off. And then we're starting to see issues where uh, the University of Illinois, for example, is uh, through their uh, Prairie Research Institute is pretty heavily invested in carbon capture technology, the part that actually captures it. And so they've been working with the Prairie State Energy Plant and the Dalman Coal Plant in Springfield to help these coal plants navigate their way toward attaching carbon capture to them and making, you know, hoping that these projects have been successful. So tens of millions of dollars of public money have gone toward planning this. And I mean, I guess it, it sounds like a, it sounds like a good thing that we capture carbon and sequester. Like, isn't that what we're all aiming for? <laughs> but it doesn't work. 
carbon capture on coal, especially, we've had a few test cases around the world and it just plain does not work. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of public money have gone into these, billions of dollars of public money have gone into these projects and they do not, they do not perform. And in fact, the Prairie State Generating Campus um, says that, you know, this, this project that we have planned here, it's not going to work. So you can't tell us that we have to capture so much carbon by this year because we know right now that we cannot do that. We're going to still do it because people make money off of that project, but it's not going to work. So you have to let us kind of, you have to let it be open-ended. We can capture maybe 40%. But uh, according to CJA and probably some federal legislation coming out, they're going to need to capture 95%. And I don't know that that is possible. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an expert in that. But all the test cases we've seen, it's not going to happen. Um, so we started off earlier in this year with the carbon, uh, kind of the pipeline companies and uh, ADM down in Decatur, the industry people all got together and said, um, we need to go to the Illinois Manufacturers Association, we need to start building allies to pass, to pass this legislation, pass a bill that pretty much allows us to dump carbon in Illinois with not a lot of regulations around it. We just need to clear a path for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, well, uh, the governor's office and uh, advocates like I mean, Jobs Coalition said, "Wait a minute! You're not just gonna um, you're not just gonna put this out without our input." And the governor's office said, "Yeah, hold up on that. We need to have everybody at the table to talk about this. All stakeholders." The industry didn't like that very much, but they were forced to do it, and everybody got in the room and they couldn't agree on anything. They did agree on two things. Um, one, that none of this captured carbon would be used for enhanced oil recovery, meaning you would take captured carbon and then force it into oil wells <clears throat> as a way to, uh, to bring up more oil. So they all said, fine, we won't do that. The second was that we promised not to pump all of this carbon under aquifers and into the ground, and then it's the state problem from there out. So we'll maintain liability for that. Spent a whole summer though, not agreeing on anything. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what happened was, uh, it, kind of, it kind of looked like, well, we're not gonna have a bill in time for veto session that everybody can live with. Um, that navigator, the company that was gonna build the pipeline through the Dakotas, they, within the last couple of weeks, have canceled that project. They said, we're not, we're dropping it. We're not going to do it anymore. Um, and then ADM, which is a big uh, kind of farm product processor in Decatur, they said, well, we're probably going to pull our project to, these projects will come back. These people will come back for another bite at it. Right now, they said the regulatory situation in Illinois is a little too shaky for us. Um, so we're going to hold off for now. The Commerce Commission staff, so the Commerce Commission gets to permit these projects. The Commerce Commission gets to determine whether or not we can use eminent domain to take people's land to run pipelines through. Commerce Commission staff, in a way that I am not familiar with, I haven't seen them do this before, their staff came out and said we should not be permitting these projects. So for now, things don't look great, but keep in mind that there are billions of dollars on the table for tax credits. So I think that this is gonna be an ongoing fight. Uh, we won't have any regulation in veto session. Uh, there is a push for a moratorium for the, the General Assembly to say that until we get regulation in place, until the federal government figures out what are the best safety measures, we need a moratorium in the state of Illinois on carbon capture, the technology itself, the pipelines and the sequestration. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what we're looking at there, but um, this will all come back up again, probably in the spring session, though there's nothing laid out that, I, that I'm aware of. And finally, in the legislative session, um, we had the nuclear moratorium that was lifted, and the governor vetoed that. 
And so we were kind of wondering what's going to happen. Is there going to be a big fight to override the governor's veto because that had a lot of bipartisan support? So the proponents of that bill have agreed not to go for a veto override. And they're going to come back in the spring and try um, try to get the governor to agree not to veto a bill that allows the lift of the nuclear moratorium, but puts size limitations on reactors. So for the smaller nukes, the modular uh, reactors, that sort of thing, I think that's what the proponents are most interested in. And I, I think that's where we're headed. Whether or not we see that come up in the spring session, I, I think we probably will. But again, um, I don't know that there's any solid plan for that right now. So last slide is kind of my, uh, just some of my, well, that's, that's my information if anybody wants to write down my email address. Um, in terms of Illinois doing its part to reduce uh, greenhouse gases and- I'm gonna take down your slides so they can see a full sure, screen. Sure, yeah, that's good. Um, how are we doing as a state policy-wise? Uh, we're doing better than most states, I think. I, I during my time working on CJA, um, I called it, um, you know, necessary but insufficient. Um, I, I think we need to be more aggressive about dealing with climate change. I think we need to be more aggressive about. Um, like shutting polluters down and all of that sort of thing. But the truth is we're on a decent path. Whether we're, or not we maintain that path is up for grabs. Uh, we have to focus on the transportation sector, which is gonna be tricky. The building sector, which is gonna be also tricky. Um, and where we land, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of talk again down down in my part of the state, there was a kind of a, a caucus of lawmakers who want and still do try to repeal parts of CJA. For example, I hear all the time about reopening the coal plants that have closed. And again, it's, I mean, the, the people who own these coal plants, the companies that own these coal plants would not, if you entice them with incentives, come back in and reopen these coal plants because they do not make money off of them, which is, I think, good for all of us that they have no profit motive to reopen these coal plants. Um, but that doesn't stop a lot of our lawmakers from still trying to push that. Nobody is going to build a coal plant um, in this country ever again because they don't make money off of it. So I think that that kind of minority of the General Assembly probably will never be taken seriously on that front. Um, but there are a lot of ways that they can limit our progress. So uh, I would say that 2024, 2025, we're probably going to see some pretty interesting legislation that'll give us an idea. Because in truth, right now, uh, those goals I showed for our, our emissions reductions in Illinois and hitting 40% um, renewable energy by uh, 2040, we're not on target. We're way off target. We're way behind where we need to be. Again, that is mostly because of the transmission. We don't have the transmission infrastructure in place. Eventually, that transmission infrastructure will get built. How much of people kind of in down my way are going to be fighting that? saying that we don't want transmission in our backyards, keep it out of here. We have a big problem in downstate Illinois with counties and individual municipalities trying to keep solar and wind out of their counties. Um, they vow to fight that, whether or not uh, the law says they have to do it. And that does threaten our ability to build enough renewable energy. Uh, so, We'll see how all of that plays out over the next couple of years and see if we can still be optimistic about the way things are going. So that's what I've got. Okay, we're gonna go to questions now. Thank you. And the first one I have is, is this. You're seeing a big push for electric vehicles and electric trucks, mm -hmm. which is gonna require 
even that much more electric power. Renewables in this present system will be able to accommodate this so-called present growth in uh, the transportation infrastructure. I, if we were to say, snap your fingers and tomorrow, we get 3 million electric vehicles on the grid, no, things would not go well. Uh, our kind of upgrading of the grid to accommodate all these electric vehicles have to match that rise of electric vehicle adoption. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, this is a little bit outside of my area, but I don't see the trend being that we're adopting at a rate so fast that we have to worry about it. But those electric vehicles, we can also, you know, using them, uh, it's called kind of beneficial electrification, where you have a fleet of school buses that's sitting idle in the summertime. There's a lot of battery storage that you could send to those buses when we're generating more than we need. And then at night we dispatch it from those buses. Those are the sorts of things that need to work in combination. So if we don't, I quote unquote, smarten our grid at the same rate that we're adopting electric vehicles, um, that could potentially be a problem. But uh, right now it, it, for the immediate future, it is, it's not so much of a problem. Okay, who's got the next one? Who's got the next question? Yes, sir. Why aren't coal plants making the right now? Uh, well, the food crop is So um, it's a little easier in some states for coal plants to make a profit than it is others, but the the cost of the coal itself and the, the cost to transport that coal is increasing. Um, so the two coal plants that are going to run until the 2040s here in Illinois, the ones owned by the city of Springfield, and then the ones owned by most of the municipal utilities, that are those are captive ratepayers. So they don't have the choice to go find another supplier. They don't have the choice. You know, they have signed these long-term contracts. So they are propping that coal up, no matter how uneconomical that coal gets for them until their cities collectively decide to do something else, they will prop that up because they don't have any other choice. Uh, the city of Springfield is finally acknowledging that the cost of coal, two years ago when uh, my friend Elizabeth here was working to close those coal plants down in Springfield, the city would not admit. They, they in fact said that this is a mistake because the cost of coal is so cheap We'll have free energy forever and we can even sell some excess energy. This year, just about a month ago, the director of the utility in Springfield said, coal's so expensive, we have to find something else. So uh, that is the reason why it's, it's not super efficient and the cost to transport it, mine it, all of that stuff is just the fuel input costs uh, have just risen too much. Okay, next question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, they haven't gotten the carbon capture up and running just yet, but. But the government is really, really full of money. Yeah. That might be why they're going That is their lifeline. Um, if uh, that's the way they see it, and when they were negotiating CJO, when their um, you know their proxies were there trying to keep that plant open, they were saying that this gives us room to attach carbon capture. And in fact, uh, they didn't want to take a 2045 closure date. They said you have to let us run indefinitely. This this plant is fairly new, and we can keep it running potentially for another 50 years. So. Yeah, they will by hook or crook. They will they will stay online. And again, because these because these cities have all bought into this plant in nine other states, um, they've signed these pretty odious contracts. Nobody really has a way out. So unless they collectively get together and kind of revolt against this plant, 
or unless federal regulation comes down to say you have to close it or state like we could we could pass a law tomorrow that says we changed our mind all coal has to shut down by 2030. so where do you see the role of nuclear power in in, in, in generation of electricity as it stands now I, this kind of cub stance on this too is that we don't love nuclear um because of its cost to rate payers but it's here and we shouldn't be trying to close nuclear down. If CJA, for example, would have said nuclear has to close by 2030, we would have no choice but to invite a bunch of gas into the state. So um, the nuclear, uh, so that's kind of the situation now. As far as like the future use of nuclear, I that is, again, like I'm not super familiar with that technology and, you know, I think the, uh, the fusion technology is not quite there, but it sounds really interesting to me, the small modular nuclear reactors. My question, especially from like a consumer advocate point of view is, you know, who pays for that? Because I, and I don't trust, I don't trust nuclear power or any other power for that matter, but nuclear power in the hands of private industry. I would be more willing to trust that sort of thing if it were, you know, state owned, I guess, as strange as that is to say sometimes, but um, especially considering, you know, where this nuclear waste is. I know that we dump it on tribal lands uh, in the Southwest too. And um, I don't feel great about that either, but um, we'll, we'll see what technology brings too. All right, who else has got a question? Anybody online, Charlie? Yes, uh, Scott, how viable is the coal mining industry in the state of Illinois? Do you know if in how many mines are operating? Or are we a net exporter of coal by barge or rail, by barge down the river or by rail to other states? Are we yeah. produce? is it a viable, a real significant industry uh, yeah. in, in the state of Illinois. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'll look to Elizabeth to correct me here, but we don't export coal, I don't believe, because our coal is pretty dirty here. And with the Wyoming, uh, Powder River Basin in Wyoming, that's, I think they do a lot more exporting. For example, the, the Prairie State Coal Plant is a mine mouth operation. So they, they mine their coal on site and then they go it goes directly into the plant. It's pretty dirty, inefficient coal, but it, it happens to work out because there are no costs in transporting it. You have the labor costs to mine it and it goes directly into the plant. Um, the coal industry in general, we don't have any more union coal workers in the state. They're all non-union um, coal jobs in Illinois. I read a statistic a few years ago that there are only a few thousand coal mining jobs left in the entire country. Um, and that's part of, I lived in Springfield for years. That was a lot of, part of the argument that the city made was that, well, we have to keep our coal plants open because we're keeping those miners in business too. Um, so that tells me, and that's a uh, mine over in Vermillion County around the Danville area. That tells me that if the city of Springfield decides to stop burning coal, that those mining jobs are probably going away too. So I, I don't think that um, it's super strong here anymore. Who else got the next question? All this right, is, Andy, uh, let, let's get him on you. Are and you loud. familiar with the latest studies coming out of Rocky Mountain Institute showing that uh, many analysts in this country, especially, have been grossly underestimating how fast solar energy is going and they, have, uh, they say uh, they expect solar to be producing more energy than coal by 2030 coal and gas it's growing it's growing exponentially and it's getting cheaper but this is not in the news and uh, yeah. you know they, they they talk about uh cutting half of our fossil fuel production by 2030 this is it's happening at that rate, but it's not it, apparently it's not getting the attention or the, or the yeah. senators and congressmen are debating it. 
built, they appear to be unaware yeah. of what's happening out in the real world. Yeah, I, I fortunately get to work with um, some people from Rocky Mountain Institute. In fact, when we were kind of in negotiations, siege of negotiations, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute um, did an analysis, financial analysis of the Prairie State Coal Plant. And that's exactly, I mean, I think they knew the results going in. That's why they were so willing to do it. Now, keep in mind that there's, there's no transparency into that plant, so they had to make some assumptions. But that's exactly what they showed was that not only should you, like this plant is at best breaking even and the, the cost of solar going down, all this stuff, like there's, yeah, there's no need for that. They So yeah, I, Rocky Mountain Institute's great. They do great research on building electrification, renewable energy, all of it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I like them and I appreciate their work a lot. They're good people over there, really smart people too. Okay, next question. Yeah, Jim. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, question yes. This is a bit off topic, but in the news every now and then over the years, we keep hearing about Germany closing down and opening and closing down. What is the real story? What is going on offhand do you know in regarding German energy production? I think he's talking about closing their nukes the and nukes, then having to yeah. use coal again. Yeah, I, um, I, I try to follow that a little bit. I have a, a friend that um, he's kind of in the energy markets business and he, uh, he did his graduate program in Munich and um, after he finished that and moved back to the States, he was talking about that, that Germany kind of prematurely closed their nuclear plants. And then, of course, we saw the footage of them coming back in to open these coal mines and Greta Thunberg gets arrested protesting that. And um, that, that friend of mine is kind of like, he, he was sort of puzzled. I think a lot of people in Germany were puzzled. Like, why would we do this? So that was kind of a silly move, yeah. Um, I've got an, another many questions. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you came to work for uh, the Citizens Utility Board? Sure, yeah. So I, uh, I'm a carpenter by trade, and I grew up, I worked on a farm until I was 20 and um, was a bit of a slacker. I didn't go back to school until I was in my mid-20s. And so um, I, I have a master's degree in political science. And while I was in my graduate program, I got an internship for two years with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. And I graduated and kind of went back to swinging a hammer for a while. And I don't want to do this. I don't want to work anymore. So. I started looking for jobs, didn't know what I wanted to do, and I, I came across, I saw Cubs ad, um, looking for looking to hire somebody, and I, that sounds like a really interesting job. So I applied, and um, I was the first downstate staffer uh, that they hired, and we opened a, a downstate office for about a year in Hillsboro, Illinois, which is this little town off of Interstate 55. That's where Ameren installed its first smart meters in Hillsborough. We want to have an office there. Um, so yeah, the first the first uh, few years at Cub was just sort of doing a lot of consumer outreach, looking at a lot of bills, talking about smart meters, and then um, then I got roped into the whole uh, after the Future Energy Jobs Act in 2016 and started working more on the policy side of it and then that kind of morphed into well, what is our policy missed in Illinois? A, it's missed closing coal plants and B, it's missed um, kind of protecting uh, people from the publicly owned utilities. So I would like to do something about that. And Cub, uh, Cub's had a reputation over the years since we're kind of limited in what we can do because it's the Cub Act it says in law, like this is what Cub does. And the wisdom has always been that the Cubs' domain is 
ComEd, Ameren, AT&T, the regulated utilities, you have no business talking about publicly owned utilities. Well, I looked at the Quebec myself a few years ago, like, I don't, I don't know about that. Maybe we should change that. And I saw on there that it says Commerce Commission, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and other public bodies. Like, well, city councils are public bodies, aren't they? So uh, I kind of made a push into, uh, into that world. Well, anybody else got questions real quick? Um, yeah, I do. Go ahead, Charlie. Is your underlying goal clean energy, or it doesn't matter as long as it's cheap energy? That is, I, that's kind of the balance. So my goal is clean energy. And this is one of the things that I have to balance is, um, because I, I do worry, I talk to, a, I still talk to a lot of people who can't afford their bills as they are. Um, but I also just, this kind of my personal thing is that cost and price shouldn't be, we shouldn't have cheap energy at the cost of kind of humanity. Um, you know, if it turned out that coal was in fact the cheapest way to make electricity, which is not, um, I still wouldn't say, well, then I guess we should go for coal. So, but I, I believe that there's a way we can have cheap energy that is affordable. I mean, it's a lot cheaper. We know that. Like one thing that RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute tells us, because there are no fuel inputs. But I also think that we can structure things in a way to, um, to kind of fund this transition to, to, to clean energy in a way that doesn't put a huge burden on rate payers. Follow-up question. Given the potential cost of a nuclear disaster, how is it in any fashion, it eludes me, can nuclear energy be considered competitively priced with the others? The cost of a nuclear disaster is astronaut, it's the greatest calamities, most costly events, far exceeding anything nature can do. The, How in the world can it be priced? Right, I, I have that, I, I agree, and I have the same argument for coal is that um, the, the cost, and now it's not as much of a, I guess, a widespread disaster, but there are a lot of costs around coal that aren't factored into the energy costs too. Like you have to clean up all that coal ash. You have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to decommission and tear down these plants. And we don't tell that, well, somebody's on the hook for that. Who's going to pay for that? Same thing, I think, with nuclear. I mean, that is a concern is that um, uh, if something does go wrong, yeah, it's going to be expensive. And, um, you know, let's not mix words on who supports nuclear you know we have we have nuclear bailouts in the state like rate payers give money to keep those plants open as a necessary you know we if we lose these plants then where are we going to get electricity so we get into the threats of well we're going to close these plants down um, if the state doesn't give us a bailout so you know the, the, the nuclear plants are are kind of propped up in extra ways, too. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it looks to me like the people of Japan will be paying forever to mm -hmm. put at the Fukushima. The cost of that is going to go on as long as that nation exists, don't you think? Oh, yeah. 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 Who would do that? You gotta be nuts to do that. What was that last part? You gotta be nuts to do that. Yeah. It's a, a disaster you cannot solve. Okay, next question. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think that's kind of what, um, uh, should we license these plants far past their 
you know, I guess safe to operate date versus um, saying that it's okay to come in and build new nuclear plants. I don't know that I support, yeah, I don't know that anybody should support that. I, if this technology were proven safe and, um, you know, not going to cost rate payers, then yeah, maybe, but uh, everything that I, and, you know, maybe this is, Everything that I have learned since I've got I've been in this for about ten years now is that it's it's too expensive, you know. And so, like I said, propping up the the existing nuclear plants as a bridge to uh, an alternative generation source is one thing, but spending um, a whole lot of money to build new plants uh, as a you know as a, as a ratepayer advocate. I have a harder time with that one. Yes, sir. Um, in uh, 2024, um, should the mega Republicans get back in, do you see any uh, diminution of progress uh, with Republican controlled administration or, or do you think maybe that the trends that we're seeing now are gonna continue forward for a while? Because yeah. um, what I've been seeing the other day is uh, Shell just, one of the big oil companies just uh, found another oil reserve that's the biggest in the world and they want to start uh, investing to running in it. And they're saying that uh, oil will still be cheaper than electric cars, and especially when we run out of minerals in this country, and that oil will still be the best way to run run things. I, I think me and the people I work with, that's like one of our biggest fears is all of this getting rolled back. And um, rolling back the, the 30 percent tax credit and uh, canceling all of these leases for offshore wind and opening up oil and gas leases. So yeah, that is I think that's a huge threat. I'm not even convinced every day that that's not a threat with <laughs> I don't know that it's going to take MAGA Republicans to come back in to threaten that. Some days I wonder about you know the current wisdom. It's like, I think one of the, the other things in the Inflation Reduction Act is the idea that, you know, for, I, I can't remember the ratio, but you, if you offer a wind lease, you also have to offer an oil lease. And the idea was, well, we're safe in doing that because nobody's crazy enough to buy an oil lease. But I don't trust, I mean, that doesn't make me feel too comfortable. So yeah, that is a huge concern of mine. Um, in the state and in the nation. Okay, are there any more questions from anybody else? If not, we're gonna yeah, I got open one. it up. Go ahead, Charlie. What precisely is the logic for advocating small nuclear reactors? I mean, is, is this that, like, if it explodes, it will only radiate a few thousand people instead of a million? That is that the logic behind this, or what? I, what is I guess I honestly small and dangerous. I guess it's small and dangerous versus large and dangerous, right? I think, I think when we get the rebuttal, I bet Elizabeth probably knows about more about this, and I I don't know the logic honestly. And uh, I think the, <laughs> you know they're referred to also as quote unquote cute nukes because they're just little modular reactors. Oh. You got me. Okay, I Charlie. Charlie, let's uh, let's move into rebuttals because it's right. like some people are chopping at the bit. I'm going to give everybody about five to six minutes for a rebuttal tonight. And who wants to go first? Jan, you're chopping at the bit. Right, thank you, Scott. Let's thank our speaker. Thank, thank you all for listening. And uh, let's uh, get our rebuttals up. It's going to be a rough five or six minutes, so. You know, since there's so few of us here, you'll get a chance early. But while I'm thinking about, you go eight minutes, that's fine. But you know, we want to try to get everybody in and. You can have you know, my time. What? You can have my time. Okay. Well, Jan, you're you're up there. You're ready to go, and uh, let's hear what you got to say because. I'm sure I'm going to have a lot to rebut you, particularly with my feelings on nuclear. 
But, you know, the funniest question that came out is what is the logic of small modular reactors? And, um, there, and no logic is required because the government, okay, the War Department through the Energy Department is avid to continue research on fission. Mm -hmm. And they are building, they want to build these small modular reactors and they're calling them uh, hey, you're taking my time, friend. And, and 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 they're calling they're calling them generators of electricity. But these projects are needed, if you'll pardon the expression, by the War Department, and the Energy Department is throwing billions. 30 billion at the, the support of small modular reactors, which are more expensive per kilowatt hour of electricity than coal or gas or, and especially solar and wind, and especially wind. Um, and Lazard, every single chart that every single graph that comes from Lazard shows that nuclear is more expensive than wind and solar and it's just completely unmistakable and this is the statistic that the Rocky Mountain Institute uses to uh, do their research. They research from Lazard and they publicize the research that's done by Lazard, which is really the gold standard in research. And the trend is, to say it's unmistakable is an understatement. It's absolutely um, unmistakable that uh, solar and wind are less expensive. Now, <clears throat> it's my opinion that the reason we're not switching over to solar and wind is because of the grid and we're not improving our grid because we don't have the political will to improve the grid. And um, what's happened in Germany, uh, we went to a, a um, talk, lecture, that was sponsored by the Unreachable Institute. And, uh, but this was a kind of a long time ago. And uh, it was presented by a German woman who was working in uh, electricity in Germany. And the problem was that um, the wind is south and the industry is north. And so there had to be a um, way of transmitting the energy from the south up to the north where the industry needed it. And um, it meant a complete change in their grid because they were switching over from, from uh, AC to DC, uh, alternating current, current to direct current. And uh, this is way out of my pay scale. I have no idea. I always thought direct current was more dangerous and worse, but they said uh, you have to have direct current for this. And I don't get that, but I, I just accept that. So um, there's, a, there's something that happened in Illinois and I'm not gonna be able to explain it very well. Downstate in the Ameren area of, of ISO, um, they were going. They they had a chance to import electricity from Iowa uh, because Iowa produces a lot more wind power than they need, and they were going to sell it to Illinois. And Exelon stopped that. No, we're not going to be buying power from um, Il Iowa, and they refused to allow the transmission lines to be put in. And this was a simple um, lack of input from the public because it could have helped them with their um, uh, electricity bills, but the, the competitor from Illinois refused to allow it to happen. Um, and I guess it isn't any surprise that I go to tons of meetings, tons of meetings. And um, it's, it, it's kind of clear 
when you really look at nuclear power, and especially when you look at the carbon capture project in uh, at, at Prairie State, and um, all of these other projects that are so heavily, heavily being uh, supported and pushed by the federal government, especially the, the War Department through the Energy Department, um, it doesn't matter whether these things work. Somebody is going to make money on them because there's more money coming into them than they can spend. And they are going to make money by uh, the, the carbon capture in the carbon capture at Prairie State is extremely, it's absolutely funny. They had to build another power plant to supply the power for the carbon capture contraction. And um, uh, so now they've got three power plants down there, the two coal plants and the one that supplies the power for the carbon capture. And um, and uh, I'm pretty well acquainted with uh, Pam and Lam Richards, who are very, very strongly opposed to the transportation of carbon. Uh, it's not carbon, it's carbon dioxide. They're very much opposed to the transportation of carbon dioxide through pipelines because the carbon dioxide is a gas, it has to be put under huge pressure and run through these pipelines. And I've got news for you. Pipelines leak. There is no such thing as a pipeline that doesn't leak. And when these pipelines leak, they leak, the, the carbon dioxide pipeline leaks carbon dioxide, and they want to store it in some huge um, porous forest uh, formation in southern or central Illinois. And, uh, you know, this is really going far afield. But what if you are a family and you live above that carbon storage spot? There's no way that carbon can be held underground. It's going to seep up. It's going to go into your family's air. And is it going to affect the raising of children is it going to affect the development of children if there's extra carbon dioxide in the air? I just ask that question, but I personally believe it will it will be a really bad thing. Um, oh, and um, oh, we need to distinguish between, between types of nuclear waste. All the nuclear waste that is going into Clyde, Utah, into uh, Andrews, Texas, and into um, the area around, excuse me, Carlsbad, New Mexico, that is low level waste. Nobody is accepting right now the uh, transportation of high level radioactive waste, which is really a deadly waste. And um, recently, IST, which stands for International storage, no, interim storage partners, ISP. This is the group in Texas that the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission suddenly or as actually gave them a license to import high level radioactive waste, which is also called spent fuel into Texas when it's not legal to put it there. Uh, and yet our own agency, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, licensed ISP to bring uh, high-level radioactive waste into Texas, and they can't do it because it's illegal. So you figure this one out. Uh, it's, a, it's boggled me. And, um, oh, and, and, then we, and then Charlie brought up the cost of a nuclear disaster. Uh, and but we haven't mentioned the Price-Anderson Act yet, but I think many people here know about this. Uh, I have a friend who brings he brings his um, uh, uh, home insurance policy with him, and he shows people right down here. It says if there is a nuclear disaster, this this policy is null and void. So what they're telling you is no. There, there, no horse would insure anybody against a nuclear disaster because a nuclear disaster is so expensive that the Price-Anderson Act had to be passed 
had to be passed before anybody would ever invest in nuclear because it is not insured. And you're not going to make an investment in an industry when there's absolutely no way of insuring it. And so um, the only reason that any kind of private company ever invested in a nuclear uh, project is because the Price-Anderson Act will cover their insurance. And they don't have to buy. You know, they don't have to buy insurance. You and I are buying the insurance, and if anything happens, it would be our money. But there's not enough money to cover a nuclear disaster. And you know, I'm off the subject here, but I personally believe there's not enough money to cover the disasters that have been caused by fossil fuel because nobody, uh, nobody that makes money on any kind of a fossil fuel has to pay for the cost of the children with asthma that, or the children that died of uh, um, asbestosis or the, uh, the women who get breast cancer or the, uh, or the stillborn children or, and I'm not trying to leave men out of this, but because they get sick also because of the car, because of fossil fuels and the things that are put into the air. But, uh, I, okay. And and then uh, I'm I, that, that it made me laugh when you said I had five minutes because I got eight minutes here. Go right ahead and keep going, Jan. Okay. We got right. time. All right. Anyway, it's very complicated to talk about new nukes versus old nukes because it, it, we've got an expression, of course, and it, this is the season for it. There's a bunch of zombie nukes out there. And one of them is Palisades, which is directly across the lake and a little north of Chicago. Now, Palisade, Palisades was closed down early. Um, it was closed down a couple of three months early because it, uh, it was getting too expensive to maintain it. And for about three or four years, they had not been maintaining it on account of they were going to shut it down. And they finally ended up shutting it down early but it has been shut down and the fuel has been removed. So Palisades, um, Governor, not Governor uh, Kirsten, what's her second name? What's her late, what, who, who's the governor of Michigan? Kirsten? Gretchen. Gretchen. Yes, Gretchen Whitmer. Yeah, Gretchen Whitmer. Okay, so Gretchen Whitmer, uh, has has gotten behind reopening Palisades because again the Department of Energy is has projected seven billion with a B dollars to reopen Palisades and so and you know I'm standing here just restless I'm stamping my foot Holtec bought Palisades from I think First Energy. No, not First Energy. Oh, I, I can't remember the names of these companies. But anyway, Holtec bought the plant and bought the decommissioning fund because Palisades is shut down, ready for decommissioning. So, Pal so Holtec moves in there and says, okay, we're taking over the de decommissioning fund and we're going to decommission this plant. Well, the decommissioning fund is disappearing and there is no decommissioning done being done. However, Palisades, which has always been a decommissioning company, has decided they want to go into small modular nuclear reactors. And so they have spent a lot of money, but of course it's not from the decommissioning fund. Uh, as doing all the paperwork to apply for a license for a small modular reactor where Palisades is. In the meantime, there's the big question, are we going to restart Palisades? Are we going to put a small modular reactor there? What's happened to the decommissioning money? And, um, uh, and, and because of the experience at Zion, we know that once that decommissioning money is in the hands of a decommissioning company, they don't have to account for it. And so uh, when we were when we were involved in the decommissioning of Zion, um, the director of nuclear energy information service, Dave Kraft, for eight years tried to demand that they send out a, um, 
an accounting of the money that was put into Zion for decommissioning. And they never would do it. And finally, they produced a four page report. The first page was a cover letter. The second page was an introduction, uh, introductory page. There was a third page with some figures on it. And the last page was a thank you very much. And uh, this is the end of it. And, it. and they never had to account for the money. But um, another, another thing that I, I did talk about the difference between high level and low level waste because the low level waste has been thin. Okay. Um, and then I personally don't understand why we need more than um, Three Mile Island, uh, Mariak that happened in Russia, um, Chernobyl and Fukushima. I don't know why we need more lessons than that on what happens when a nuclear power plant goes wrong. Uh, there is a new movie out called SOS, San Onofre Syndrome, that explains the problem at San Onofre with the nuclear waste and the danger uh, of that waste being on the beach in California. And I have a picture of a friend of mine measuring the, the seawall. The seawall is 14 feet high and it doesn't account for a high tide. The seawall is 14 feet high at low tide. And um, the tsunami that hit Fukushima was I think 40 feet, something like that. <coughs> so the, the, the nuclear waste is buried on the beach 100 yards from that seawall and there are many casks there of uh, high level radioactive waste that will be, um, that, that, that could easily reach criticality if it gets un inundated. Uh, we, we should all try to go see uh, SOS. Uh, it's not really available yet, uh, but, but some of us have gotten the chance to see it. They did do a free uh, showing and um, it's a little too long for this program. I think it lasts uh, something like 90 minutes, but um, so it would be too long to bring to uh, a college of conflict. So, um, I, uh, the logic of nukes was my last thing. And um, I'm, I'm a, a I really, I think I really got into studying this because I'm so interested in the physics. I'm not a physicist, but there's a lot of stuff about what happens to an atom when you split it. And the, uh, Helen Caldicott has got four pages of different isotopes that are created when uh, uh, uranium-235 is split by uh, a neutron. Uh, four pages of different stuff that comes out of it. And um, one of those things is plutonium. And as um, uh, Admiral Rickover, Admiral Rickover can be quoted saying, you know, when life developed out of there was no plutonium because plutonium has a half-life of something like 24,000 years. And it takes a few million years for it to really go away. And by the time life came along, it had all been, uh, it had all decayed into some other, into other um, uh, isotopes that were not so dangerous. And those isotopes had also decayed. So the earth was pretty, was completely clean of plutonium before life could develop. And now we've brought plutonium back. And um, it, uh, I don't know what we're going to do about that. Um, but it, it's kind of a heartbreaker that we've brought so much plutonium back into the world and um, these things diffuse. So it's almost impossible to keep radioactive waste from diffusing. Uh, and obviously the, um, the explosions in Nevada spread radioactive uh, isotopes all over the United States. Um, and I won't go into anything personal about this, but I will say 
that my sister died and she had every kind of cancer. She lived in Utah and she visited Southern Utah on a regular basis. So I am, um, you know, sooner or later I have to shut up, don't I, Kim? Okay. You gotta tell me my time's up. Or well, I'll go. We, were, we were finding it interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna rebut you next, but I'm gonna try to keep my remarks somewhat because I, I vote for the same uh, knowledge. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Jan. We appreciate, we appreciate, uh, we appreciate you, your thing. Okay, let's talk about nukes for a minute. We can all agree that the light water reactor in its present day form is not the best way to generate nuclear power. The thing is, what you have to do, there's a whole bunch of different ways of generating nuclear power. And the one thing I do want to recommend is that there's a different kind of reactor out there. It's called the liquid fluoride reactor, which was actually worked on in the 1960s at Oak Ridge. The biggest thing about that one is it operates at atmospheric pressure and does not need water, high pressure water coolant. Because what does the cooling is uh, fluoride salts that run in it. And it's been, uh, it was ran for well over 5,000 hours in the 1960s. The government decided to uh, not pursue it and try to pursue a different kind of reactor, which is called a breeder reactor. What was the heat source? Do they have cooling towers at all? No, it's a- uh, yeah, uh, it, it's actually it's actually a, a piping system that cools through either the Brayton cycle or the generation of electricity. But the thing is, um, you need to pressurize water to about 300 degrees in order to do a, a cool down the reactor. And the only way they can do that is through high pressure. The thing is, fluoride salts are a solid at room temperature and have to be heated up to about 1300 degrees, which is an ideal cool it for reactors and they have a whole big base of uh, pressurized uh, water. The thing is, is that what it does is you mix the nuclear fuel in with the fluoride salts through a salt loop in the reactor itself. And then uh, there's a second loop of salts that's separate from it that they generate the heat from. The thing is, is that uh, if something happens, there's a drain plug at the bottom of the reactor, it goes into a, into a uh, into a, like a little open pit and solidifies. Basically, it doesn't mix with the environment. You could what make happens the the radio, What happens with the radioactive steam? Where Sorry, does that... let me finish, please. What happens with the radioactive steam? There is no radioactive steam because you don't have water. How do you run the generator? You run the generator through another loop of molten salt that's quite high and you can either use a Brayton cycle or something else to do so. That salt dissipates heat rather quickly. And when you generate electricity on it, you can also uh, cool it off a lot quicker. Oh, and the the water 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 back into the reactor. Well, so in times past, you're still confused with what the light water reactor does and the liquid fluoride reactor. The thing is, I'm still talking about a conventional power plant that's burning uranium-235 in with this, but there is a different way of running it. It's called thorium, which basically can be, uh, you know, which eventually, be, be. anyway, I'm not gonna get into the mechanics of it, but there is a better way of doing fluoride, liquid fluoride thorium reactors. And with all this long-term level waste that they're talking about, it can be actually burned up and have the isotopes taken care of in other ways. Now, for me, the small, the reason we have the liquid fluoride reactors now is because it's the first use of uh, the uh, reactors. Rickover just basically took a submarine reactor and got it big. And that's why we have a lot of the problems with it now. And that's one of the reasons it's so expensive is that we don't want to see anything happen. On the liquid fluoride reactor, what happens is you have to keep that reactor going. It naturally wants to shut down and you have to keep it going. And there is some form of self-regulation in there. The thing is, there's also a different kind of fuel that you use for it. Um, it is uranium-233 that is made from, the, from, a, from what they call thorium, which when you bombard it, 
will beta decay within 28 days to about uh, uranium-233, which can be used for the reactor. It's a man-made element. And then a uranium-233 can then be used and burned up much more efficiently. Our control rods right now only use about 1% of the uranium in there, and the rest is waste. That is still waste. When you go to the thorium reactors or even just a liquid fluoride reactor in, in the hole, well, there's almost a 100% burn up, which means you don't have the waste. And you can make the reactor the size of this room, including the shielding for waste products that would power the entire city of Chicago. And the thing is, these are now being made. I know one company right now uh, that's actually trying to make these the size of a, of a, of a truck or a truck bed that will basically be used to transport things around the years. And there's a lot more innovation in this space than you guys realize. Now, I'm not going to say that nuclear is the end all, the end all, because it is a dangerous thing. There is radioactivity involved, and there is the problem with waste. You know, even with these reactors, you're still going to have to keep the waste sequestered under the ground for about 400 years before it reduces itself to background. For more information on this topic, I strongly suggest all of you look at the uh, thoriumenergyalliance.org website. There's a ton of information on thorium reactors. There's a ton of information that it can be and will, and probably will be a viable form of climate change. The thing is that Genie's now out of the bottle on these thorium reactors because guess what folks, they're running one right now in China and they're gonna be commercializing it in less than a year or two. And China's betting heavily on uh, shutting its coal plant plants down through these modular reactors because they've got well over 600 scientists on it and they've been trying to do this. The thing is what happens with China is that they use the very same technology that we did in the 60s. They're just taking what we used, upgrading it, and they're gonna be using it now to power their country. And I think in this one case, they may be on the right track. And the thing is with thorium, that's also a waste product that's classified as a nuclear waste that's always dripping with these metals that you use for your electric cars, your rare earth metals, for your neomagnetium things, and it's got to be stored and used somewhere. And there's a bill right now before Congress to establish something called the Thorium Bank. And all they're going to do is not funded by the taxpayer, but will be used by mining companies to transport the thorium from their mines, put them in these huge storage buildings for the explicit purpose of finding use for the uh, thorium metal. Now, right now, thorium is used in mantles and some other things like that and, and other things, but there's also other ways that it can be used. Thorium's half-life is about half-life of the universe, so it's a very safer form of uh, radioactive metal. You can hold it in your hand and not have any ill effects. Um, the thing is, is that I, I learned about this about 12 years ago We've had people here talking about it. And although I could spend the next few minutes getting into the technical terms of it, it is a safe and viable form to replace what we've got. It just needs a little more funding from our government to do so. We're already pouring billions of dollars into some of these goofy technologies that like carbon sequester and everything else. I've also heard too that with all the drilling going on, that we could probably drill deep, deep down enough towards the mantle of the earth that we could probably use the heat that comes from the earth to power 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 plants in the form of geothermal but can be done anywhere and we've already got that expertise from these deep level oil that's running on these oil companies and uh, why not just use their drilling expertise to go down closer to the mantle of the earth to get the heat that comes out of there there's a million different ways we could solve this problem. I think nuclear is going to be a key component to it. And that's not discounting solar, wind, or any of the other renewables. But folks, according to an author of a book on written on superfuel, his name was Richard Martin, who does a deep dive into this. And the book was published about 2010, says this. This thorium revolution is going to happen, whether it's going to be now in the next 10 years or 50 years from now. Once we discover how safe it is and how much power we can get from a fission, that'll put basically, because fission's a hell of a lot easier to do than fusion. And if we're gonna really wanna get off oil, we're gonna need to replace that power with something. And that's gonna be electric electricity. And it's probably gonna be processed heat 
from those reactors for industrial use, then we'll probably do it. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. Andy, I know you're chomping at the bit, so come on up. That was the biggest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard at the college. Well, Charlie, considering that I've done my research, reactor doesn't use water. I don't know what you're talking about, Charlie. And this reactor doesn't use water. Charlie, one fool at a time. Yes. Now I got to listen to nonsense. I want my three bucks back. All right, Charlie. We're not charging tuition tonight here, Charlie. So uh, we're waiving fees tonight because it's a small crowd and uh, we're going to be okay. Andy, you're up. You're up next, and go ahead. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, I'd like to you know follow up what Jan said. <clears throat> a couple of things. One, uh, Germany shut down all our nuclear plants. I understand after they saw what happened at Fukushima, right? Yep, they did, and there was a worldwide outcry. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that didn't know, all of our radiation monitors on the West Coast, all around California and Oregon. The West Coast radiation monitors were shut down as the cloud from Fukushima drifted toward our country. The in infant sudden death infant problem with babies dying suddenly mysteriously went up quite a bit while the Fukushima cloud drifted over. You can't say that any one baby was caused uh, died because of that. It's a statistical thing. Like we know about a third of heavy smokers die. Smoking doesn't kill everybody, but statistically smoking four packs a day is bad for your health. We know that. It's so the mathematicians <clears throat> can prove these things. John Goffman, probably uh, 1966, he was the father of radiation and human health. Are you all familiar with John Goffman? Do you know who he is? He published a book called Poison Power. And he was part of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission. He was commissioned to do a study of what, how many deaths would we have from nuclear radiation pollution leaking out along the fuel cycle? How many people would a nuclear power industry kill every year? And he said, well, he came up with a figure of about 3,300. You know, and the nuclear power people just went nuts. <clears throat> and they said, well, you can't publish that. It will alarm the public. So, so he went on the campaign trail. In 1967, they were talking about having 1,600 nuclear reactors running on American soil. I don't know if you ever heard that story. We had, it was in the infancy. There were only a handful running in 1967. They just passed the Price-Anderson Act because nobody would build them without complete immunity. And there was a... a a safety report, the Rasmussen report or something like that. They asked the uh, man from the AC, um, what's the best safety record you can hope for? You know, a meltdown, uh, a, a disaster if one explodes. And he said, well, we don't expect to have more than one meltdown every thousand years of reactor service. And somebody looked at that chart on the wall and said, uh, by the year 2000, we're going to have 1,600 running. You know, well, what is that? You're going to be logging 1,600 years worth of reactor service every year. What, is, what are the odds for a big meltdown or something? He said, well, this is 1967. The public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. They thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil. It's right there in the history books, right? <clears throat> so a whole bunch of nuclear science says, oh, crap. There goes our golf playing Wednesdays. We got to get on the campaign trail and get our crap together and put a nip this in the bud, which they did. And no new, new, no nothing new in this country was really ordered after 1974. Forbes magazine ran the cover story. I think it's in 1985. It had a picture of a cooling tower on the cover. This was Forbes, and he said they they lost more money on nuclear power than we spent. On putting a man on the moon, um, 118 billion. He said this is the largest managerial industrial disaster in world history, and since then the data has just gotten more and more and more solid. And we published an article in 1985. 
uh, for those of you that don't know, my brother and I have started out as a hobby, and now we just call it the Northwest Information Service. We collect and translate books and publish one-page briefing papers on 10 or 15, 20 books a database. We've got several hundred books on the effects of nuclear power and why it's not a viable energy source compared to the other cheaper sources. And Rocky Mountain Institute has been publishing this since 1984. said <clears throat> a super insulated house can be dropped down by helicopter anywhere in the country and run up a few square meters of solar cells on the roof. Uh, that's how energy efficiency cuts your need for energy by 90%. Why are they talking about beefing up the grid when they should be talking about cutting consumption in half? With ret deep retrofits, it's called. There's uh, <clears throat> Rocky Mountain Institute is promoting a program called the Decarbonization of America. Uh, maybe Charlie will talk about this in his plan uh, for coming up in, uh, is it January? December, maybe. Anyway, the, we outlined, uh, we, we identified five major benefits of nuclear power back in 1985. There's been, you can talk about the benefits, like it'll, it'll be a population reduction program through pollution. But the main one from uh, number one is bankruptcy. Uh, nuclear power takes in a ton of government money and then they can do what Donald Trump has done, file bankruptcy and the people that uh, were managing it, you know, they make money. Uh, no, no nuclear power plant is gonna make money selling kilowatts. They're propped up with government welfare. Second thing is the nuclear power industry and the mining industry just spreads nuclear bomb technology and material all over the planet. The third thing is, it's basically uh, as nuclear radiation leaks out, you got population control. Like uh, the area around Chernobyl is unlivable. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the uranium weapons that are being used in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Kosovo, those three countries have been listed as uninhabitable for humans since 2005. They're so polluted with radioactive depleted uranium dust that comes from leftover uranium material in the nuclear power industry. And there's no way to get around that if you have a whole cycle of mining uranium and uh, transporting it in trucks or trains or whatever. Um, it's just subject to leakage into the human environment. And then my favorite, of course, is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Having nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons allows the religious people to say, Armageddon is coming. Armageddon is coming here soon. We're going to have a nuclear war. For those of you that missed it, because it wasn't in the news, I didn't know about it either <clears throat> until we got the books. Jerry Falwell was giving Bible prophecy meetings in the Pentagon in 1987 to teach our generals how to read the end time signs of the Middle East conflict. So we would launch a full scale attack, get rid of the Soviet Union, we cleanse the planet of the evil empire, and we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. But this one has to be destroyed first. And nuclear power and nuclear weapons is the best way to do it. Now, we nipped that in the bud back in 1987, supposedly. But, but that ghost just keeps rising up out of the ground and telling us, well, we got a new generation of nuclear plants. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what form of nuclear plant it takes, you're mining uranium and spreading nuclear materials all over the planet. The other thing is any kind of new nuclear reactor can't compete with the original nuclear reactor This that doesn't have any pollution problems. That's the one that's up there 93 million miles away. We call it the sun. It sends us 10,000 times more energy every day to light. All we got to do is collect it in various forms. If we collect one ten thousand of the nuclear power that comes to us from the sun every day, we don't need coal, oil, gas, or nukes. And you couple that with high efficiency, like the houses in Chamber with no furnace that heat for $10 a month, or houses like what they build in Wisconsin. One watt houses, one watt per square for the living space. First time I saw that logo, I said, what the hell is a one watt house? Because a 100 watt light bulb would heat 100 square feet of that house. 1,500 square foot house needs 1,500 watts of heat. 
the Germans wrote that in 1988, 1978. They said, if you have a 1,500 square foot house, you can heat it with a toaster or hair dryer. If you have a 3,000 square foot house like what they build in America, you're going to need a toaster and a hair dryer. You spend the furnace money on the walls and windows and glass. Make, you live in a thermos bottle shaped like a house. It costs the same or less to build. And it, the, the energy requirements are one-tenth. And of course, the, the retrofit program coming out of Rocky Mountain Institute is kilowatt for kilowatt cheaper than building any kind of nuclear power plant. It's called the megawatt revolution, and it's picking up speed all over the place. It's not being reported. That's why in my talk on December 9th, we're going to talk about things that are happening, that are documented, and not reported by the mainstream media. And oh, if Charlie's listening, I'd like to correct one thing he said earlier. We won't be talking about any conspiracies of any kind on December 9th. We're going to be talking about programs, documented evidence, things that are happening, proven beneficial things that are happening all over the world. No conspiracies, Charlie. So uh, don't don't add that anymore to, to my, my write up. So uh, in, in summary, what I can say, I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, building new nuclear power plants to try to, talking about building new nukes to combat the, the climate crisis. That, that's like, that what? Nothing. You should what? I'm trying to get it to rebut. Oh, well, anyway, the last, uh, think talking about building a new generation of any kind of nuclear power plant, even if it's totally safe, the time frame it takes to build it would be that it's like, it's like, like remodeling your bathroom while your house is burning down around you. Miami and my, Miami and New York are going to be flooding every year underwater long before the next generation of any kind of nuclear plant can make any kind of decent contribution to our energy mix. We have to address the climate crisis and the fastest things to do it is stopping burning fossil fuel and mass, mass produce 100 mile per gallon cars. All the car companies have 100 mile per gallon prototypes since 1980. But they don't talk about that in our press, do they? No, Rocky Mountain Institute has a hypercar, 98 miles to the gallon. They designed it in eight months. <clears throat> and it would be an affordable, crash-worthy vehicle made out of uh, graphite uh, and all kinds of lightweight materials. It's called a hypercar division. For those of you that uh, are not familiar with um, all, all the different programs that are running from Rocky Mountain Institute. But I, I highly suggest there are two websites. <clears throat> if you want beneficial knowledge, for what we can do now, the two websites are Rocky Mountain Institute, that's rmi.org, and there's another one called wanttoknow.info, wanttoknow.info. They have huge archives of censored news of beneficial things that are going on all over the place. It's an alternative to the flood of 24-7 propaganda we get in this country. The last thing I'll say is, 96 it occurred the, uh, the numbers going up it was 76 a couple months ago now it's 96 96 cities in this country have changed their building codes or in the process of changing their building codes to eliminate gas pipe for new construction they're talking about retrofitting old houses but for new the codes for new you just can't sell a gas furnace or a gas stove it's going to be all electric the customer the last call i did last night checking a furnace <clears throat> the customer said I paid $10,000 for this gas stove and you know, the luxury stove in his kitchen. He says, I'm not, I'm not giving up my stove. I'm going to defend this. Even if you know, the Biden people come to my door to try to repossess my stove, I'm not giving it up. He's under the impression that uh, Biden has passed a law that says they're going after the stoves of people that have gas stoves in their house. And I said, what source of information do you get your information from? He said, well, the only the only honest source out there is Fox News. That's the only thing I want. <laughs> and that's what that DVD, uh, um, there's a, a movie, uh, Censored News, the movie, 2013. It's a DVD you can order for $20 or something online. It's 
it tells how their, their primary uh, thesis is America is separated. The media has separated you know, families. You have family members that are at each other's throats believing stuff because there's a, there's a, a concept called a book, The Brainwashing My Dad, how Fox News brainwashes people into thinking things that aren't real. They're, they're just not real at all. And that's why it's important for those of you that are interested in a huge dose of documented reality with no conspiracies in there at all, come see my talk on Jan, uh, December, December 9th, December 16th. Am I night? I'm on, I'm on the night. December 9th. I'm sorry. And Charlie is the 16th following up on uh, the climate change and what can, what can There'll be done. There'll be a bunch of disinformation on the 16th, I'm sure. Oh, uh, well, uh, hopefully uh, it'll be uh, documented information. Incidentally, uh, for those of you that are interested in learning about what's happening on the climate and what to do about it, there's a book called The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg. She edited a book, put together about 30 or 40 experts. I'm still digesting that book. I've had it six months. It's If you don't have time to read an encyclopedia on what's happening on climate change, get Greta's that one book. The climate book is what it's called, and it, it's just what we're we're here. So in the last thing, I saw an article three days ago. A group of people are studying how to relocate Manhattan and move it inland or something as the waters rise, because uh, Manhattan is only six feet above sea level, a couple of meters. So they're they're finally recognizing that the oceans are rising, the ice is melting, and we don't have thirty or forty years to mess around with this. Miami's getting flooded every year in places with the hurricanes now, right? <coughs> Houston, the same thing. So anyway, well, thank you and uh, thank our speaker. Uh, he's going to have the last word. And go ahead and uh, take it to what time you need to rebut us or just thank us to get out of here. Oh, I got a you got a rebuttal, Charlie? Yes, I uh, just want to thank our speaker. Uh, just covered a few things. Uh, Number one, uh, thorium, if you look on the, remember your chemistry or physics, look on the periodic chart of elements. Thorium is in the family of radioactive elements. It is. Uh, you can do all, you can use 233, 235, 239 to run a reactor. Yeah. It in various ways, different ways. I said before that the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. To get up here and to say this is something uh, different and apart from that technology is fallacious. Charlie, you're nothing but low grade uranium. It's at the lower end of the scale. And to say, well, it's different is if you stood outside a thorium reactor and a standard reactor, you could not probably tell the difference by looking at it. So don't, don't come up with stuff like this. It's something See, Charlie, again, again, I'm just saying you don't know what you're talking about because you've never oh. read the literature, which is full of but generalization. Thorium I know what you're talking about. Once you get the right, thorium reaction us. going, they are all the same. All the thorium, oh. once it gets going, it's the same old thing. You know, no, oh. all right. Come right, on, Charlie, and let's right. just face facts. Let's let our speaker go. All right, thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. You get the last word. No, I... I... Thank you for having me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tune in on Saturdays because uh, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate you all coming and uh, letting me talk, and uh, stay in touch. We will. I hope you got another one in you because we'd like to hear hear you again soon. Sometime maybe the summer. I'll come back summer. anytime. All right. I'll all come right. Back Let's, so you want to just wrap it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I, tell us it. Okay.